Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Accelerate and Scale Big Data Analytics with Disaggregated Compute and Storage, jointly hosted by Intel and Alexio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Amelia, and I will be your moderator. We are very fortunate to have two experts presenting today. Before I introduce you to our speakers, I've just got a few housekeeping items. All participants are automatically on mute throughout the presentation. If you have any concerns or wish to communicate with me, you may do so by selecting questions from the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. Just type your message or question and I will be able to see it. I will be monitoring this throughout the presentation. We will have a Q&A session at the end of our presentation so we can answer all of your questions. To ask a question, select questions from the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. You may ask your question at any time during the presentation and don't need to wait till the end. Lastly, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand playback from our website. We will send you the link to the presentation in the following days. Those are all the housekeeping items, so let's meet our speakers. I'm very pleased to welcome Brian Porter. Brian Porter is a Senior Program Manager for Big Data Technology with Intel's Open Source Technology Center, focusing on Hadoop, Spark, and software-defined storage. Brian brings over 20 years of information technology infrastructure experience and leadership, including at IBM Global Services, First Republic Bank, SSA Networks, and Plumtree Software. Co-presenting with Brian is Alex Ma. Alex is the Director of Solutions Engineering at Alexio. Alex is an open source veteran. Prior to Alexio, he worked at Couchbase, where he was the Director of Solutions Engineering and Principal Architect. Brian and Alex, thanks for joining us. Uh, without further ado, I will pass this on to Brian. Great, thanks Amelia. So today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, we'll go into a little bit of the background and kind of why we're uh, talking about uh, big data and, and big aggregated storage. Uh, we'll look at some of the challenges, uh, some of the uh, optimizations that our team has found. Uh, we'll talk about how uh, Alexio uh, works into that solution uh, and where we see it as a, a real fit uh, for the big data environment. Uh, and then we'll sum everything up. So the, the challenges of uh, Hadoop storage, and for anyone who's, who's working in the uh, Hadoop Spark space, uh, you start to see it, is uh, as you grow your environment, the compute and storage aren't growing at the same rate. Uh, we are seeing exponential growth overall in storage infrastructure, and, and trying to bound your storage uh, with capacity of your, uh, of your CPU infrastructure um, it just isn't working. Um, we see kind of growing, uh, growing data capacity, more siloing of data, uh, and costs uh, growing very, very quickly uh, in, in the big data space. Uh, what people are looking for is, is performance and efficiency is one of the you know, key hallmarks of a, a truly uh, well-managed, well-maintained environment. Alex? So, along with the um, challenges of scaling the Hadoop infrastructure, uh, there's some additional trends that we notice that are driving the need for new architectures as well as new solutions. And so, the things that we have noticed are things like the separation of compute and storage, um, both hybrid and multi-cloud environments. And hybrid cloud being where you know some component of uh, the infrastructure remains on-prem in a physical data center, and some component lays out in uh, a cloud of some kind, uh, or environments where users are leveraging multiple clouds to support their infrastructures. Uh, we notice the rise of the object store, uh, both uh, cloud-supported as well as on-prem. And the last trend that we notice is the need for data across the enterprise and the need for that data to be self-service. Uh, we see many users where data goes through this very complicated migration of first location and identification, then migration, then access, 
uh, that can sometimes take weeks or months. And with today's challenges and today's data needs, um, data needs to be accessible in a much more self-service way across the enterprise. And so these are some of the things that we've noticed uh, driving the need for new architectures, which we'll, uh, we'll dig into shortly. Thanks, Alex. So, so what are we seeing as far as uh, types of infrastructure? So, you know, and, and we've seen this uh, in the computer infrastructure field for, for a long time. There's, you know, we're going to build it really big and get very large clusters and try to encompass everything. The problem there being choice and neighbor. Uh, that, that large finance or that large marketing job that, that uh, kind of uh, pushes everyone else out and, and really makes you miss your SLA. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, and then there's the, the multiple small clusters, uh, which make you grow and scale uh, a number of individual components, have to do version control and uh, you know, upgrades on, on different cycles and, and really make it hard to, to really gain the economy of scale, particularly as these environments grow. And there's also the, the, the ability to, to over-provision. So what people are looking for really is that, that cloud-like, on-demand analytic cluster that has a common set of resources where you're not copying your data all over the place, but are able to leverage a single pool of disk allowing you to add the compute as needed and spin up and spin down the, the compute as it works for your business and for your enterprise. So let's take a look at disaggregated storage. Um, the beauty of Hadoop when it first came out was very much around data lookup, that your compute would be right there with the, the data that it was working on and that that would uh, give you the fastest ability to, to scale massively and to, to be available. Uh, that worked as the data was growing, but that has broken as data has got so much bigger than the compute infrastructure that they fit on. Whether it be batch or streaming or interactive, data is coming at the environment in such a way that you need to be able to manage that infrastructure separately. So, so let's take a look at some of the challenges. So typically what we're seeing uh, in our lab is that when people go to, to build this disaggregated storage layer, whether it be the leveraging technologies like Ceph or others, uh, particularly using things like uh, S3 and S3A as the way of uh, basically communicating to the HDFS storage, um, the biggest problem we see is tuning. If you see the, the line on the bottom uh, left, uh, just how much an improper default configuration costs you in, in overall uh, performance. Um, if you look at the top left in the success rate of the query, so something like a TCCDS, um, you're, you're seeing kind of failures across the board. These are all due to improper configuration. Uh, improper setup for the middleware uh, and, and, and leaving kind of uh, default configurations in your uh, spark that you've been trying to The common architectures we see when people begin to move away from having localized uh, HDFS store, uh, one, uh, running it behind a dedicated load balancer, uh, the second, running it behind either uh, a dedicated DNS uh, or uh, code gateways. Um, uh, fourth, a, a fully disaggregated architecture. Um, but, but fifth, what we're seeing a lot of now and what is really kind of starting to uh, be the direction that a lot of folks are going is uh, leveraging technologies like Alexio to, to really cache and bring that, that data that is no longer local to the environment back to the environment making it uh, easier to access from, from the compute layer. So looking at the, uh, the, the tuning uh, challenges for, uh, for the Hadoop Spark stack, particularly in, in disaggregation, one of the things we sort of see around S3A uh, really is the performance of the uh, teardown and, and setup of, of TCP. And when we 
If you're looking uh, at this chart, um, please take a look at the graph on the uh, upper left. Um, and where you see Terrasort just completely failing, um, if you look at S3A versus remote HDFS, remote HDFS is making calls and, and it's coming back. S3A with SAS is communicating back and forth with the, the, the S3 gateway is communicating back and forth with SAS and, and both spinning up and tearing down the network connection. Um, and so one of the things that we see, and this has been a big call up for us, is just how much tuning we need to do to the environment um, and we've made sure that we uh, are leaving, uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have links to uh, some of our, our findings, some areas that uh, we found that really helped in, in kind of clearing up some of these issues. Uh, but, but tuned correctly uh, and, and really leveraging the, the proper tuning of the environment, we've seen as much as an 11x uh, improvement of that. Uh, really being able to uh, leverage uh, the, the true power of the infrastructure. So as we're uh, looking at the infrastructure, you know, things that we're looking at, ingest, ETL, batch, uh, we're looking to make sure that we're able to, um, to really see uh, interactive queries, machine learning. We're using uh, Terrasort for the, the heavy read-write load as we're, we're looking at the performance of the environment. For TCP DS, uh, we're using that for, for batch analytics, and queries, uh, and then we're using K-Means as our proxy for kind of machine learning as we really kind of look at the overall performance of disaggregated storage against your, your compute resources. So what are the performance gaps we're seeing? Well, if you look at the chart on the top, um, you can see that the orange is a local HDFS store. The can is remote HDFS, and the blue is SAS. And, and what you're seeing is, you know, you're taking up to a 60% hit on, on object store, which, you know, as your environment is growing, you need to have the option to be able to uh, have these larger infrastructures and be able to leverage them in your analytic environment. But nobody wants to take that, that 60% hit. Um, and, and we see that because of the way that S3 is writing um, and, and the fact that it doesn't support things like transactional rights. You know, as, as it goes to do something uh, like, uh, even like a, a simple uh, rename, it's actually having to go through and recursively walk down, down the tree. But there's ways that, that we can improve that, and, and we'll, we'll walk you through that. So, so what do you do to, to kind of get yourself back to the performance that you lose by building this large data store? Um, In-memory accelerator, and specifically Alexio as your in-memory accelerator. Thanks, Brian. Um, with Alexio, you can, you can definitely use it as an in-memory accelerator. And what we see in this diagram is, is kind of the topology that this plays in. So up at the top, what we call uh, the northbound side in Alexio speak are a number of the compute and big data frameworks and machine learning frameworks that are popular today that are used to ask questions of big data. And so one of the things you'll notice is that these all have a preference for what kind of interface they prefer to talk to. And so what these are able to do is they're all able to speak in the interface of their choice uh, to Alexio because Alexio offers a number of different APIs and interfaces. Uh, as you can see here, the Java API, HDFS, S3, or POSIX, or REST, so that these things can all talk to Alexio in, in the way that they best fit. Um, Alexio also has a number of driver options, and those drivers allow it to talk to a number of storage technologies on the southbound side. And so what we have support for are things like traditional HDFS. Um, we have support for on-prem based 
object stores uh, that might be talking Swift or an S3 API. Um, we have support for uh, any of the cloud-based object or blob stores like S3, GCP, or Azure. And we also have support for traditional NFS. And so what Alexio allows you to do uh, in this in-memory data acceleration layer is allow any of these technologies on the north side to be able to commute to communicate to any of the storage technologies on the southbound side. And we work together to essentially bring the data closer to the compute. And we'll walk through a little bit of what that looks like uh, a couple slides from now. Uh, but this is a quick overview of just the kind of technologies that Alexio interfaces with and um, the kind of things that it can touch. So one of the technologies that uh, Alexio enables is uh, Intel's new uh, persistent memory. So persistent memory is a, a new class of, of memory and storage technology. Uh, Intel this year introduced uh, Octane DC persistent memory, uh, along with Octane solid state drive. Uh, Optane persistent memory acts as uh, DRAMs uh, that sit on your, your box uh, and allow you a much higher density of storage uh, for caching in your environment, uh, up to six terabytes per system. Optane solid state drives um, are a, a new medium that allows for much faster hard disk speeds um, and really gives you just an incredible uh, amount of uh, uh, not only speed but also endurance for uh, for a storage medium. Uh, the second uh, RDMA, which is a uh, remote direct access memory, uh, remote direct memory access, uh, which basically allows for technologies to no longer uh, or servers to no longer have stranded capacity. Um, RDMA enabled servers. Uh, will allow a, a server at the, the top of rack that needs additional disk to pull storage from a, uh, another server in that rack uh, without involving the CPU, with zero uh, copy or, or performance loss, uh, and bypassing the, the kernel uh, of the box that it's pulling from completely. Uh, it is fast, it is efficient, uh, and it's another way that we're going to be able to expand these large data infrastructures without having to compromise and, and not to strand resources on, on boxes that, that don't need it, right? Um, and also not to, to pull uh, from the, the CPU and overall performance uh, of boxes just because you need it for other capacity. So uh, Optane Persistent Memory uh, works in three different modes. Uh, so there's a memory mode that works as if it was a traditional DRAM. Uh, there's AppDirect, which acts, uh, really leverages the, the power of it and really gives you the ability to work with some of the newer features that are in this new medium. Uh, again, um, you can not only do, do three terabytes, but now you're able to do six terabytes on a, an individual system. Uh, and then there's storage over AppDirect in, in yellow. Uh, and storage over at AppDirect is what we've been working with the uh, Alexio team on uh, to basically access DRAM as if it were just uh, local to, to the system, um, thus being able to leverage for, for caching uh, and able to see some real performance advantages in your environment. So, so this is what it looks like. You know, as, as you get uh, Alexio in your environment, um, it sits as a layer, um, you know, leveraging these newer technologies, persistent memory, uh, RDMA, uh, to allow for caching of hot data, right? And, and shortening that IO stack to make your files and to make your uh, storage environment uh, faster and more efficient. Uh, it's unifying the, the underlying file system and really kind of optimizing uh, your environment's way to get to that data. This is uh, what our test uh, environment looks like. Um, these are kind of all of the, the components 
with your compute, uh, with Alexio, and your storage environment uh, separated, um, running a uh, SAS data. So what do we see when we run uh, when we run Alexio with uh, s 3 Well, let's take a look at the the um, test we were running earlier. So we have the uh, batch, the I/O, and uh, the KME uh, that were running on localized uh, HDFS. Um, then we have in blue the original run with just the uh, S3 remote. And then look at the numbers for the light blue. Right, and see the, the overall performance enhancement, uh, particularly in Terrasort, where if you're just pushing, you know, reads and writes, uh, the fact that that storage no, or the, the compute no longer has to deal with the, the storage, um, you're seeing some, some real strong gains in the overall performance in your environment. Right, um, we're minimizing the uh, amount of, of overhead you um, have to deal with. For having remote storage, but allowing you that large, easier to maintain, easier to keep consistent, not having to copy your data all over the place, much larger data store, right? That data lake in a much more consistent manner um, without having to take the performance hit and being able to get your business critical, infrastructure critical uh, work done. So what's next for, for Intel and Alexio? So as I talked about, there are a number of different modes of accessing uh, persistent memory. One of the things we're working with the Alexio team on right now is moving them to, to AppDirect so that we can get better control over uh, how the memory is being used and, and really try to drive the performance. We're excited to work with their team. So here we're going to walk through some more of the use cases that Alexio enables. Uh, I think we've seen uh, from Brian's test results how Alexio can help when you disaggregate compute and storage, when you're leveraging something like HDFS versus something like uh, S3 over Ceph. Um, but here we'll take a look at some other common ways that Alexio is used to help with big data infrastructures. And so I'd say the first one is, is probably the simplest one. And here we're just we're just kind of shifting the topology around. Um, one of the ways that um, it's used very commonly is to accelerate big data frameworks on the public cloud. Now, whether you're using uh, AWS, um, GCP, or Azure, uh, in either of these cases, um, all three cloud providers provide very scalable, very cost-efficient cloud-based object stores or blob stores. And in either case, um, using Alexio uh, as an in-memory data accelerator can help to accelerate the performance of these object stores and provide more consistent performance, especially for, for hot data workloads. And so in this example, you know, we're looking at what Spark and Alexio looks like when it's talking to S3. Uh, that's a very common uh, pattern on uh, AWS EMR. Uh, but we also work with things like Presto or you know, any, other, any of the other big data frameworks that you might see in the public cloud. Um, another topology shift that we help to accelerate is when customers are looking to burst a part of their workloads into a hybrid cloud environment. And a hybrid cloud is where you might, in this example, have HDFS running on-prem, but you want to take advantage of cloud-based compute uh, because it makes sense. And this, this makes a lot of sense in Spark ML workloads, in TensorFlow-based workloads, workloads where you're trying to leverage a GPU and uh, these things are very expensive. They have a very long lead time. Um, and you can simply get capacity from one of the, the cloud uh, providers um, while leveraging the, the data sets and the training data that you have in-house. And so in these situations, Alexio can help out by, again, bringing the data closer to the compute 
so that you're able to um, more efficiently run these training models, more efficiently run these um, these big data frameworks. Uh, and this, again, works regardless of how the topology is laid out. It could be your data is living on-prem with your compute bursting out to the cloud, or it could be that you want to take advantage of S3 or GCP uh, and take advantage of it from a storage perspective uh, and have your compute in-house. Uh, the last one that we talked about where Alexio can add a lot of value is, is what we've been um, discussing over the course of the last 20 minutes or so, how Alexio can help with on-prem based object stores, things like Ceph or Cleversafe, um, Alexio can help dramatically speed up access to data on these object stores uh, and give them the ability to help with workloads that they otherwise might not have been a great fit for. So we've talked a lot about how Alexio can help with some of these things, uh, but we haven't talked about the why of it. And that's what we're going to look at right now. We're going to look at a few of the key innovations within Alexio uh, and a little bit about how Alexio works so that you can get an understanding of how it is able to help address some of these challenges and how it can help with some of these workloads. And so the key innovations that we're going to look at are things like data locality, data accessibility, and data elasticity. And so we'll look at what each of these mean in the context of Alexio um, helping out with a big data framework as well as a storage layer in the next few slides. And so data locality with intelligent multi-tiering, uh, what that really means is that the Alexio technology is able to leverage some of the resources on these compute nodes. Now, typically, when we're running things like Spark or MapReduce, Presto or TensorFlow, um, these technologies are going to be very compute bound uh, with some to medium level of binding on memory or I.O., right? Um, it's mainly going to be compute that they are after. And so typically what we're able to do is we're able to run Alexio alongside these technologies and allocate some of the resources on these machines to Alexio. And what Alexio is able to do then is it's able to create uh, distinct tiers uh, for keeping that data that's being requested of it. Um, you can create the tiers and specify whatever is available on the machine. You might just have um, memory, you might just have SSD, you might have um, uh, HDD, uh, but whatever it is that you have available to allocate, you can allocate to Alexio and it will automatically manage um, the storage of the hottest data to the coldest data along those tiers. Uh, alongside that, Alexio will also manage the connection to uh, the data store that you are referencing. And so it might be Ceph, it might be HDFS, it might be S3, but what it's able to do is sit with your compute frameworks and help to, again, bring the data closer to the compute. Let's, um, let's see here. So let's look at what that looks like in practice. Um, with data accessibility, uh, again, the example that we walked through earlier is making data more accessible. And so in this case, what we're looking at is we're looking at Apache Spark, talking through HDFS, to S3 and connecting to AWS S3 or Ceph. And what it's able to do is handle the translation or the semantic mismatch or the impotence mismatch between some of these different frameworks, which may be talking in one API uh, and expecting something completely different. And so in this case, um, Spark is able to talk generically to Alexio. Uh, it's able to talk to it through HDFS, and Alexia is able to translate it to uh, a request along a path for any of these given data providers. And so what it, what it can mean is that it gives you a lot of flexibility in your storage choices, um, because a lot of this is abstracted behind Alexio, and Alexio can simplify the connection of these things 
so that instead of having to connect your compute framework to multiple different storage systems, you can simply connect it to Alexio and have Alexio manage the, the complexity behind that for you. In terms of data elasticity, uh, this is another example of, of what we mean by making data more accessible to users uh, that actually need it. And so again, Alexio provides a unified file system hierarchy uh, and it presents it to your application. And so what that really means is that your application will connect to Alexio, it'll connect through a host and a port, and it will see a given file system hierarchy. In this case, it'll see two folders underneath the root mount point called data and users. And each of these folders hold reports and sales and Alice and Bob. Um, and that's essentially what your application is working with. It knows that there is this data that's accessible to it. And if it goes down the path of users, it can find information for Bob. It go, if it goes down the path of data, it can find information about reports and sales. But what is happening underneath the hood is that Alexio is actually mounting multiple remote storage systems and abstracting that complexity away from your application. So in this case, we have HDFS mounted under the root partition. And under the data partition, what we have mounted is a S3 bucket. It could be through Ceph, it could be through um, AWS S3. Um, but again, we present a single unified file system hierarchy to your application to again, simplify access to the data and simplify the logistics of, of actually connecting to these technologies. Um, in terms of a reference architecture, this is what this typically looks like in terms of Alexio deployment. And so as we discussed earlier, uh, Alexio workers are gonna be typically installed co-located with the compute framework. And in this case, both Spark and Presto are able to talk to Alexio through a client library. And all this is is just a, a jar that is on the class path for these applications so that they can understand what Alexio is uh, and what an Alexio URI is. Um, the path of the data request is, is fairly simple. If, if Presto is requesting you know, a given file uh, to work on, it's doing a, a select query. Um, it will look up through Hive, you know, where that table definition lives, and see that it lives on a Alexio URI along a given path, mapping to a specific Parquet file. And so it will say, "Hey, you know, Alexio, I need to uh, I need to query this Parquet file." And so the Alexio client will talk to the Alexio master, which will tell it, "Hey, I have this set of workers, Alexio workers in a cluster." None of these workers actually have this information. It's located on HDFS. And so what will happen is it will tell the local Alexio worker on the node that um, this was requested from uh, where this is. That worker will pull that Parquet file from HDFS and store it in one of its data tiers, whether it's memory, SSD, or HDD, um, and service that request to Presto. Now, the next time that piece of information is requested, let's say we do the same kind of query through Spark SQL, um, the Alexio master will say, hey, worker one actually has that piece of data you're interested in, why don't you fetch it from him? And so in this way, what we're able to do is we're able to bring the hottest, most requested data local to the Alexio workers so that we can service this from memory speeds and avoid having to go over the network wire for each one of these single requests. The other benefit is that since this is local to the Alexio workers and since we're leveraging RAM, um, the consistency of these queries and the performance that we're able to get out of it is, is obviously much higher than it would be sometimes through the native technology, especially if we're talking about something like Ceph or S3, which we've seen in, in Brian's results earlier today. So from an Alexio standpoint, um, there are a number of enterprises and a number of community users that are leveraging this technology to independently scale compute and storage. So some of the names that you see here uh, have large scale production implementations that are leveraging things like Spark, Presto, GCS, 
uh, S3, uh, as well as TensorFlow to solve problems, problems at production scale, uh, all with Alexio helping to accelerate in-memory data access. From a community standpoint, uh, Alexio has a lot of open source momentum behind it. We're an Apache 2.0 licensed project with hundreds of thousands of downloads, uh, a thousand plus contributors, and 4,000 plus Git stars. As a call to action, you know, please stay tuned in for further updates. Uh, we'll be sending out the slide deck uh, as well as the recording to this presentation later today. Uh, as well, there's a there's a blog that you can access uh, that's linked here. If you have any questions, uh, we're going to stay open for chat, but you can also join the Luxio community uh, through any of the mechanisms that you see listed below. We have a community Slack channel uh, as well as Twitter. Great, thank you, Brian and Alex. That was a lot of great information, and I can see that we already have a few questions. As a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please select questions from the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. Our first question, and this one's for Alex, is what is the best way to scale performance of this solution? Does it scale horizontally? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, so again, with the, the typical way Alexia is deployed, um, where it is co-located with the compute node, um, it's it's a it, it's a very horizontally scaling uh, type of solution. Uh, I think one of our largest deployments is running something like 1,300 Alexia worker nodes in a single cluster, co-located with Apache Spark. And so what it's able to do is scale horizontally along with the compute framework, whether it be Spark, MapReduce, Presto, TensorFlow, uh, and again, enhance the experience for that big data application. Um, this is with the older 1.x product. Uh, with the newer 2.0 product that just released, uh, we've actually taken steps to ensure that it can scale to even higher levels both from a number of workers in a given cluster perspective, as well as the number of files that is able to handle. And we have actually some really interesting blogs that walk through the technology improvements that we've made in the 2.0 product and some of the architecture changes that allow for us to handle that kind of scaling. Uh, but yes, it's, it's a horizontally scaling solution and uh, we have it running in large scale in production deployments. Great, thank you, Alex. Uh, next question is for Brian. What are the performance cost benefits of persistent memory over NVMe? So persistent memory um, is a, uh, basically it comes at a, a dim form factor. Um, because it is on the, the motherboard, it is a lot faster, significantly more performance than NVMe, which um, similar to PCI is just a, a new format for uh, transiting uh, data back and forth from, from the disk. Uh, we're very excited about NVMe, and as we talked about RDMA, RDMA runs over the uh, NVMe infrastructure, right, um, and allows direct access to disk via NVMe. Uh, NVMe. Um, Octane runs on, on NVMe, the, the SSDs, um, but yeah, you're going to see a much faster um, performance. Uh, like I said, it's uh, slightly slower than an actual DRAM, um, but uh, very, very on par and much higher density um, with the, the newer persistent memory um, storage technology. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next question for Alex here. Uh, without naming a current Alexio customer, uh, could you please share a real-life use case example and Alexio's impact on the business top line, bottom line, and risk mitigation in measurable metrics? Sure thing. Uh, I'll do. I'll do my best. So, 
one use case that comes to mind is, is actually kind of an interesting one and one that I alluded to kind of earlier in the talk today. Um, but what it comes down to is machine learning uh, with training data sets and being able to leverage cloud technologies and the ability to burst into cloud. And so this customer um, is one that leverages machine learning at, at large scale. And so they have uh, a Hadoop cluster with large amount of data in HDFS. And what they were looking to do is to be able to add on and augment their existing big data workloads by bursting out to the cloud to get additional compute capacity to handle their machine learning training and model development. And so if you're familiar with machine learning, um, it's, it's a very uh, data movement intense exercise. Uh, typically the way these things work is that they're able to scan through training data sets uh, and learn from them. And what ends up happening is you will run the model with multiple different variables changed. Um, and you know, you'll finish that run, you'll pick the best parameters out of that iteration and you'll continue iterating. And we have customers that will iterate, you know, hundreds of times over the exact same data set in order to get this model fully trained and tuned. And the way these machine learning models work is that the more data they have, the better uh, it can be, right? The more iterations they can go through, the more accurate the model can be. And so it benefits them to have very, very large data sets and to have very, very large iterations. Um, and the challenges with this is that when you're bursting out to the cloud and your data is disaggregated from your compute, um, you're talking about moving a very large amount of data around. And in this case, this customer um, had this exact same pattern, right? They burst out to comp uh, their compute to the cloud to take advantage of um, cloud economies in terms of running their compute, whether it be CPU-based or GPU-based uh, Spark ML uh, training models. Um, and uh, that was that was the model they were working on. And so they introduced Alexio into this, um, into this equation. And what Alexio was able to do was save a good amount of the egress cost and ingress cost for data coming in and out of the environment. Uh, essentially, they were able to take the hit on loading data from HDFS within their data center uh, just once, uh, be able to iterate through that in the cloud numerous times, leveraging uh, Alexio as the in-memory data accelerator. Uh, and the end result of it is that, you know, from a business standpoint, they're able to train and develop four times as many machine learning models per year as they were before. Uh, I'm not sure what that equates to in terms of you know a business metric, but from a high level metric, um, they're able to do a lot more with with exactly what they have. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you, Alex. I've also sent into our chat box two links uh, to one is to the white paper and the other is to the case study that Alex was uh, sharing with folks. Uh, we have another question. For Alex, and this one uh, is, are there certain characteristics that make some workloads a better fit for this architecture, and what are they? Sure. Um, so I think the, the characteristics that best fit Aluxio are, are the ones that, you know, it was kind of designed for. And, you know, there's obviously many different types of workloads in the data and big data spaces. Uh, but the ones that Alexio is most geared towards, I would say right now in the current incarnation of the product, is ones where, you know, the data is essentially written once and then read many, many, many times. Uh, and so we see this in a lot of different scenarios. We see this in ETL workloads, uh, in big data querying workloads, in machine learning workloads. Um, and so I would say those scenarios where you're going to leverage needing to read the data multiple times, um, needing to more efficiently scale out your storage uh, in a more cost-effective manner, 
or simplify the complexity of your storage layer. Those are, those are all characteristics uh, that you can look for uh, when, where Alexio might be able to add uh, a lot of value very quickly. Great, we got another question here for Alex. Uh, is this supported by Kubernetes? Uh, yeah, so uh, we have support for, for both Docker, uh, Docker containers as well as Kubernetes. Um, so we have a, a few landing pages that Amelia can link to that will provide a, a quick getting started for how to get it up and running with, with Docker if you're looking for just you know, how to get up very quickly with Alexio. And then uh, a follow on for how to run that container on a Kubernetes platform, whether it's AKS or EKS or if you're running Kubernetes on your own uh, within the data center. Uh, but yes, we support both. Great, I just shared with folks the link to our documentation for deploying with Kubernetes. Wonderful. Um, thank you all for the great questions and for being here with us today. I want to thank Brian and Alex for today's wonderful presentation. Uh, as a reminder, we will email you a link to the recorded webinar and this deck. Uh, this concludes today's webinar. Have a great day.